It's time for Timothy Talk on the Big Fat American Radio Network. I'm your best friend in the whole wide world, Zach Martin. You know, nothing seems to go according to plan, Timothy Welsh, does it? Oh, no. If uh, we ever knew God's plan, we would be amazed. I think if God ever really let us in on what his entire plan is for us, we'd be stopped in our tracks. We wouldn't be able to believe it. Oh, you know, you got to, I guess, look at the incredible, believe the incredible, and many things can happen, or words to that effect. Uh, when When we were growing up, right, most of us, well, let's just talk about being parents. When we have children, we figure that our kids will be able to grow up healthy. They'll go to school, and they'll... Uh, maybe go to high school and college, maybe join the service, maybe get into a trade, maybe go to college, maybe become a doctor, maybe become a pilot. We just want them to be healthy and successful as individuals. Uh, A lot of times those plans don't work out. We get the curveball. You get that diagnosis. And and believe me, John Christostom, who is a, a saint of the church, once said, there's always somebody who has it worse. And No matter what our situation is, it's true. Uh, There's always somebody who has it a lot worse. So I would say instead of looking at the negative and looking at the bad things that are happening to you, try to see what's around you and what you can utilize. What are your assets? And take those assets and make something positive out of it. I know a lot of people are suffering from depression. A lot of people are thinking about suicide. The suicide rates for Generation Z, by the way, are off the charts. It, and I don't know why that is. I, I, I have an idea. I think social media plays into that in which everybody's reality, although distorted, becomes almost delusional. It, n- we're not all going to be these great athletes. We're not all, uh, all going to be famous people, rock stars or actresses or actors or, or uh, you know, what the world looks as successful. But, you know, we can be happy. We've got to learn how to do that. And one of the ways is by doing the best you can with what you're given. So uh, with that being said, let's go over to Timothy Welsh, who is the star of the show. We are praying for Dax Shepard and Christine Bell. Uh, what's going on with Dax and Christine? For some reason, they have become the new spokespeople for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, on, on the one hand, they try to do a vegan-friendly uh, line for babies, but then on the other hand, they're just spouting off things that uh, are just vicious attacks towards individuals dealing with uh, vaccine injury and health issues. And it's for the life of me, I can't understand the vitriolic nature of their attacks upon people who are having issues, health issues, and just spouting the one propaganda, uh, vaccines are safe, vaccines are effective, vaccines save lives. They they just do that bumper sticker propaganda over and over again, but they throw in some things that just are um, saying that they don't believe people's story and basically just um, being bullies about it. Well, I find that a lot of times people bully those who, for whatever reason, remind them of their own shortcomings. That's, that's what bullying is all about. I make you feel good about myself, bully on the other person. The other way to really cut somebody down the size, if they don't agree with you or they believe differently than you, you assign a label to them. An anti-vaxxer. You're a nut job. You're this. You're that. You're a Nazi. You're hateful. You're a bigot. They uh, use these labels that are really like, when you think about it, hypocritical, because the last thing anybody would like to consider themselves is a bigot. So when you're calling somebody a crazy anti-vaxxer who's trying to make a point, maybe they have a vaccine injured loved one in their life, you're a crazy anti-vaxxer, you're a conspiracy theorist, Uh, just change the word to any any other way of describing a human being. And what is that going to sound like? Look at yourself in the mirror when you say those things. And instead of point- the, 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 the person he went after in particular yesterday um, was a person who lost their child and within hours of a, a vaccine. A vaccine, yeah, and, I read about that. And, and, and so, you know, to me, what possible gain to the individual Dax or Kristen can they have by going after a person who has gone through such a horrific experience? Um, well, you know, it comes down to this. I find a lot of people that are so pro vaccine. It's amazing how many don't have children and the ones that are pro vaccine. It's amazing how many of them didn't have any 
problems or issues with their children that they know of right now. And I, I come back down to this. It's not that we're anti-vax, anti-vax people. I would say I'm all about risk analysis. And I have uh, a couple of friends that are highly educated doctors who would say the same thing. Now, in regard to the whole risk analysis, one thing that has to come into play is this good or bad for you? Or how about this? Let's, let's before we get to the risk analysis, let me give you another kind of analogy. There are people who are vegans. You're a vegan, right, Timothy? Yes, yeah. I'm and, and, 99% and, that way. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm almost uh, uh, 100% too. Um, I'm more vegetarian. I'll eat fish. I, I don't have much meat at all unless I go somewhere and somebody prepares some meat for me. I, I try not to insult them. And, and I'll have a little bit. But okay. So the reason why you want to eat healthy, uh, there's a variety. You, you want better health. You want longevity. You want to be there for your kids, whatever the reason might be. You want to look good. How about that? So you drink your water, but you got to make sure that it's good water, right? Good water source. You don't want to drink any water that's tainted or has amoebas in it or some sort of bacteria or heavy metals or whatever it might be that's not good to consume as part of your water. So you'll check that. And like, I'm not going to have any water unless I know it comes from a good filtered source. You might not have any carbonated drinks. I guess, you know, um, club soda, flavored club soda might be okay. You'll, you'll go with that. But you'll say, Mm-mm, I don't want to do this Diet Coke or Diet Pepsi or Diet this or Diet that. Have you looked at the chemicals on these things? I mean, it just sounds gross. I can't even pronounce half of them. There's an old adage. If you can't pronounce it on the label, maybe you shouldn't have it. And then maybe you'll say, ah, you know what? I got to avoid sugar foods. Sugars are dangerous. I mean, they're really bad for you. Cereal. Oh, my gosh. I better go whole grain if I do anything at all. And then you get the, uh, you know, the breads and the whole wheats. We'll get to bread later on because I know it's something you want to talk about. So you go over and you look at your diet and you say, I'm going to avoid meat. I'm only going to eat vegetables. Oh, it turns out that kale here, by the way, out of all the vegetables, has the most insecticides. Don't want to have any insecticides in my system. Don't want to ingest that. And people take a lot of time and care into looking over the ingredients and the packaging, and they try to make good, educated choices, especially if they say they're vegan or want to avoid uh, genetically modified organisms. You do non-GMO diets. So why is that acceptable? And why doesn't, and if people make fun of you, you just laugh it off. But why is that okay? But a person who will look at medications that they're about to take, and whether it's a vaccination or over-the-counter or a prescribed medicine, there's one medication I could tell you about that I won't take because I, I didn't like the side effects. Okay, why is it not okay to go over the ingredients and decide and to opt out? Why don't we have a choice over our bodies in that, in that uh, circumstance? So the answer will be, well, you know what? You're an endangerment to other people around you. I'm like, not if you're vaccinated, I'm not. So why don't you talk a little bit about that kind of uh, analogy that I just gave, the hypocrisy that uh, I see when I, when I speak this way, when I think about this. Let me give, get your take on all of this, Timothy. My latest kind of putting together my thoughts on this matter is the fact that um, the argument they use is that for the greater good, we used to have this rule called Hippocratic Oath that the doctors swore to that said, first, do no harm. And it worked for thousands of years. Excuse me. It worked for thousands of years, and now we, the your doctor does not take that oath anymore. He does not say, or she does not say, first do no harm. She, she or he says, for the good of the community. Well, again, the community standard needs to be analyzed in some way and say, okay, I use this benchmark 1978 when the experts say that's when we were the healthiest. Since then, there's by every metric and every analytic possible, we've had just a flat out straight decline in health. And so I want to give them back tools to say, okay, I'm willing to go for the greater good and the better for the community if you can show me health is improving. Uh, For each individual, it's an individual choice. And then you get into the whole Nuremberg trials and um, body autonomy. You should have control of what goes into your body. And that's a kind of a medical rule. Nobody will do medical testing on you unless you know 
what they call informed consent. You know the, the good things, the bad things, the long-term things, everything that can impact you. You don't force a medical procedure on somebody. And so those are kind of the, the rules and things that are being bent and broken at the moment. And we just need to take a stand to say what is what worked for thousands of years in the medical profession should be brought to bear as far as the benchmark of what's going on now. Well, I think there's something to this benchmark 1978. And when I think about growing up being a kid, well, it was completely different, really, on so many different levels. We'd go outside and play, and we never had to worry about being abducted or kidnapped. Now it's something that you really have to think about. There's a lot of weirdos out in the streets, and trafficking is off the charts. Now, a lot of people will think that trafficking is only about sex trafficking, but it can be also uh, re human resource trafficking. And what I mean by that, basic slave labor. You can get people from other places throughout the world to work like slaves for free. And if they don't comply, well, bad things will happen to them. So you really have to be cognizant of what's going around you and your community. And don't assume that your child can't be victimized by that because it's quite plausible. Uh, so there's that in mind, the security issue with our kids. There's also people who are really irresponsible that are out in the roads driving cars. And, you know, it's a bad mix. I remember playing out in the street, Timothy. Remember that? It, you, maybe we played hockey or football or baseball. and For, for hours football, and hours yeah, right. and hours. Yep. And, and we'd play light post to light post. Those are our end zones. And any time a car came down the street, was halfway down, somebody yelled, car! And we all move out of the way. And uh, then around dinner time and, and during the school year when it would get darker earlier, mom would yell out the window, Zachary, get up, it's time for dinner. Not now, mom, give me five more minutes. Now, get home now. So you'd say, sorry, guys, you got to go. And you'd go home and eat. And the foods prepared for you were just amazing. Grandma did our cooking. And it was old school, old world type of stuff. And a lot of people would look at those Food items say, well, that's bad for you. You know what? Not as bad as processed food. It was all made by scratch. Grandma would start working on it late morning, early afternoon. And by the time dinner time would come around, everything was made. Besides all of that, you know, we might have, uh, Timothy, I might have had maybe four or five vaccinations, tops. We all got them, you know, and uh, we didn't have a high prevalence of autism back then. Now, a lot of people would say, well, the diagnostics have changed, so that more people end up on what is called the spectrum. I disagree. I would say that in my school growing up, I didn't know anybody that had any special needs other than maybe an occasional person that had Down syndrome or uh, developmentally delayed, and we used different terms back then, then, and I won't use them now, and they were institutionalized, and that's a sad thing. I think we could do so much better with people uh, that live with disabilities. And we also did other things. We'd go play on the, uh, in the farms, you know, in the marshes. We'd go fishing. Uh, we all had to learn how to swim by the age of seven because we grew up in the Jersey Shore. We'd uh, do all kinds of crazy things. We'd get dirt all over us. And I think most of us had really good immunity. I mean, we were pretty healthy kids. We weren't sickly, that's for sure. There was always one or two that had a hard time or had some sort of medical condition. And, and that's unfortunate. But uh, I, I agree with you. Benchmark 78, it seemed like after that, everything went south, especially in the late 90s. And we see that there were changes into, uh, there were changes uh, on laws and there were changes on vaccine protocol. And then we start seeing bad things happening. So why is it at that point? If it's genetic and all of a sudden we see this, I don't know, uh, in the 90s, we start seeing genetics and people going, well, one in 59, it's all genetic. These people have genetic reasons why they're autistic. Well, if, if that doesn't disturb you, I don't, I don't know what else will because we're either devolving, we're going extinct, something is dramatically wrong. And just because a genetic predisposition uh, uh, exists, there has to be something that starts it or activates it. So it's a complex situation. I'm, you know, when we talk like this, Timothy, well, you're not a doctor, what would you know? Hey, listen, you know, I know a lot of doctors that, think the earth is flat. How about that? But they're really good doctors. Maybe they just specialize in certain things. So I think critical thinking skills and just having honest and open discussions and sharing information without any preconceived notion going in, 
and trying to chill on the biasness of it and take the politics out of it and see what we're really dealing with, maybe then we can come uh, up with some great answers. And if somebody has been damaged by vaccine or somebody is special needs, what are we going to do for them moving forward? So that's why I have uh, put together BFA Media, which will hire people of disabilities, specifically those on the spectrum, with jobs that are meaningful and really helpful to businesses that utilize those skills and services and that devotion to duty. Uh, plus, it's also going to raise living standards. Then we have the community idea that we're going to evolve down the road as well. But step one is to create more jobs for people across the country. That takes money. We've got business plans. We're working on it. Uh, it could be by mid-July when we'll have more answers for you. Let me just say this, uh, Timothy. The deck is about 50 pages from what I understand. And at one point I thought, and, and you probably thought this too, Timothy, why did you become an advocate? Why did you become a voice for Tanner? And I'm like, Why am I doing what I do? Look at the Bible. There was a Noah, there was an Abraham, there was a John the Baptist, there was a Mary and the mother of God, there was Joseph, uh, Jesus' stepdad, Mary's chaste husband. There's all these biblical fi uh, figures that you can read about that they took on what God gave them to do. They said, yes, I'll do it. And they move forward. And if you're working in the will of God, nothing's going to stop you. And you'll live a better life. You'll be happier because you're not focusing on what you don't have. You're not focusing on things that are too far away for you to touch. You're focusing on the present. You're focusing on the now. And you're dealing with your situation as it is, utilizing those assets around you. I came to the world of, of advocacy, activism, through life experience. And you bring up the point about, um, well, you're not a doctor. You don't have a, the PhD, MD um, letters behind your name. But the insidiousness of that pedestal and idolatry that we give to doctors has gone to the point where this week I witnessed a conversation where somebody said, well, how dare you ask a doctor to read a study? How dare you ask a question? And, it, and it, first of all, I reacted kind of immaturely, and I said, well, how dare a doctor listen to a 22-year-old who just graduated with a BA, BS, and a short skirt and, and pretty makeup and listen to that pharmaceutical rep over me with 17 years' experience? But never in the time that I've been an advocate do I say to a doctor, this is what you th should think. This is what you should do. This is what you should prescribe. This is how you should practice medicine. All I'm doing as a father, as a parent advocate, as a health freedom advocate is asking questions. And when we get to a society that does censorship and says you're not allowed to ask questions anymore, we're going to take away your Facebook pages. We're going to take away your MailChimp. We're going to take away your ability to monetize your YouTube channel. When society starts doing that for something as innocuous of just asking questions about health, Something is upside down, and this is the time for everybody to rise up and say the freedoms we lose today and the rights we, we lose today will be very, very difficult to get back in the future. What are some of the other things going on? Um, the, we had a very big rally day and um, assembly day in California yesterday where they gave the opposition 10 minutes to speak, and uh, Robert F. Kennedy flew across the country to be at that hearing and to speak. But what they didn't tell them was that they had given the speakers uh, X amount of time, but they didn't say that the clock would run in between the speakers. So when the opposition got up to speak, the, the people spoke before, Dr., uh, before Robert F. Kennedy junior and the clock was still ticking and ticked in between so when it got to his turn to speak as the final speaker they said oh your time's up and so here he was flew all the way across the country to speak at this hearing and they wouldn't even let him speak so that's how far our um politicians have gone to mute the voices we put up uh, in dissent of their um paid uh politics that they're in the middle of 
Well, let's have some fun for a second. You were talking about your diet. We were talking about vegan diets as an alternative. We're talking about non-GMOs. And I think one of the biggest things to try to avoid for all of us is bread. I went to Germany, just to give you an example. And I swear all the people of Germany must just feast on pretzels, bread, and beer that, <laughs> and sandwiches. That's all I said. Uh, and sausages. And thinking to myself, well, gosh, what's the longevity around this place? And a lot of elderly Germans walking around. Well, maybe, maybe not so elderly. They weren't really walking around. Well, anyway, having said that, um, what's uh, your deal with bread? You were talking about this the other day. I kind of laughed about it, and uh, I, I forgot what we were talking about because I do that. The um, the thing about we try to talk about one or two little tips that can help you as far as looking at your diet and saying, how can I get rid of that man belly fat? I mean, it, it's you obviously is eat less and exercise and all those things they always tell you. But one of the things that just gets into our diet and then is difficult for the body to process in a way that just gets it out of the system is your breads and grains. And so talking to a dietitian about a month or so ago, uh, he, he said to me, have you really looked at the grains and the breads that you put into your diet? And so, of course, I go into one of those um sandwich shops and they have all oh, this day old baguettes that are sitting there and they're only 75 cents. And I said, what's the harm? I'm just going to buy one of these big loaves of bread. And of course I come home and I think I'm being good. I don't put any butter on it. And I just chow down on this hard crusty roll and think I'm doing well for my diet. But when I step on the scale again, I've gained a couple pounds. And so I just wanted to say, you know, bread is one of those things that, oh, are kind of addictive and it's designed that way. But then it's also something that just kind of packs on the pounds and translates into fat really quickly. And I'm not the dietitian. I don't know how that does it, but it's just something the dietitian told me that maybe we should think about. Mm, that makes sense to me. Uh, what's going on on social media that you find really fascinating? And it doesn't have to be with anything regarding life on the spectrum, just things that made you laugh. Yeah, there wasn't, um, there really wasn't anything that I just pops into my head. Every time somebody asks me that in my lifetime says, Oh, tell me a joke. I always tell <laughs> the least funny thing and the most obnoxious thing and the most politically incorrect thing. Yeah. So, I always try to, to bite my tongue okay. and, and really think deeply about that. Well, I'll I go, think that's I'll, one, of, one of the casualties of being on the spectrum is that we have to think through things and uh, we have to be politically correct when we open our mouths like that. Well, I'll tell you what I thought was really funny. It was a meme where all these kids were in class and they had the thought bubbles as the kid raised their hands. And so it was just normal conversation until uh, the one kid up in the front row uh, you see in the box, he goes, catechumens depart. Let the catechumens depart. May no catechumen remain. And it turns out his dad was a deacon in the Orthodox Church. So I, I got a giggle out of that one. And the standby joke that I love the most, which is funny from age 8 to 80 and then some, is how do you know when a cow is laughing? How do you know when a cow is laughing? Milk comes out of its nose. All right. Uh, with that being said, uh, one last thing before we uh, uh, say goodbye until next time. You have this uh, whole thing that you sent me a text about money. Money, the root of all resources. And um, you're right. Uh, it, it, and the evil is the censorship these days. Money, money can be evil if it's used for the wrong things. And one of the things that we have to do in regard to material objects and money, sometimes... We're called to do things, and you can't consider the cost. And that is God asking you to have faith in his plan. And let me talk, talk to you a little bit about a lesson of faith. And we do this all the time where we believe in invisible objects. Or we have the faith that whoever made the chair that you're sitting on is going to hold up to our weight, even if you are Timothy and you eat a lot of bread and you've gained some weight. But we have faith in these objects around us. We have faith in the stage, if you're a rock and roller when you go up there. You have faith that your guitar strings won't break, but there's always backs up, backups just in case. You have faith uh, uh, in the other person that you don't know that's driving the other car, 
And the only thing that's separating you in the opposite direction as you pass 70, 80 miles per hour is that yellow line. So to tell me that you don't have any faith is kind of, well, it's not really true. We have faith in things. But what kind of faith are we talking here? Do you have faith to, you know, walk across the, uh, you know, uh, walk across the, the Niagara Falls on a tightrope like those tightrope acts? Do you have faith in the tightrope walker that has the barrel going over the rope and can carry all this weight? It says, what man would like to go across the falls? No, you don't have that kind of faith. Who would? I don't blame you. Uh, let's think about this faith for the next week. Think about your faith in God. Think about your faith in people. Think about your faith in the people around you. Think about your faith in your child. Think about your faith in little ones. Think about your faith in the big ones. Think about your faith in the politicians. Just maybe journal it. But let's th- focus on faith this week. And then next week, we'll talk about different ways. And Timothy is going to have some different uh, ideas to, to add to this on how you can make your current situation a little bit better. And if you improve your current situation each week just a little bit better, before you know it, things are going to be pretty darn good. But let me just give you this one caveat. Nobody's life is perfect. Nothing goes to plan. We only can count on now. You can't count on tomorrow because anything can happen. So live every day to the fullest. And what does that mean? In my world, my suggestion to you, Make sure that you have a good, strong, faithful relationship with God.